We continue in our series today called I Believe as we look at uh, the Apostles' Creed, the statement of faith that was written around 100 A.D. uh, for two reasons. Do you remember? To teach and to combat. 100 A.D., Bibles weren't complete within one big book. The whole Bible was written, but it wasn't compiled into one big book. And so when people were wondering, what do Christians believe? It's not like you could just say, here, here's a Bible. Download the YouVersion Bible app and you can read all about it. No, they couldn't do that. Uh, And so what they did was the pastors and theologians sat down, they looked at the truths of Scripture, and they pulled out all the truths about God. And they formed this statement of faith that we call the Creed. The creed was written to teach about God and to also combat errors about God. Because already in the first century church, false teachings were creeping around the Christian church about who God is and what he did. Up until this point, for the last eight weeks, which is crazy, it's been eight weeks already, we've been looking at this vertical relationship that we have with God. We've looked at God the Father. We've seen how he's a creator God and a provider. He provides all things for our lives. We've seen Jesus, how he is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one from the Old Testament who came into the world, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, buried, descended into hell, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, where he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. There, he is ruling all things. There, he's preparing you a room in his heavenly home, and there, he is advocating to you through the Father. We learned about the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit advocates to you. He takes what Jesus has done, and he teaches you. He reminds you. He testifies that Jesus is the Christ, and he tells you and reminds you and teaches you. This whole past eight weeks has all been about who God is and what he's done for you, vertical. Today, we go horizontal. What does this vertical relationship mean for our horizontal relationships. How does our relationship with God impact the way we live with others? That's what we're going to look at today as we look at the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Two notes before we dive in. If you've been in church background before, you probably know the creed, and you probably know that the original phrase was the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Why the change to Christian? When the creed was written, it wasn't originally written in English, uh, but when it was translated into English, they had Holy Catholic Church using the real meaning of Catholic, which is universal. That's what Catholic means. So what they were confessing is we believe in the Holy Universal Church. Today, when you hear the word Catholic, uh, you think of Roman Catholic Church. Well, that's not what the creed is saying. They're not saying we believe in the Roman Catholic Church. We believe in the universal Christian church. That's note number one. Note number two is the communion of saints describes the holy Christian church. There are two phrases that essentially mean the same thing with a little different nuance. And we're going to explore what that means as we talk about the holy Christian church, the communion of saints today. And what we're going to see is how it impacts our lives today. So, where are we going to learn all about this? Revelation chapter 7. And now that I said Revelation, all of you are piqued. Your interest is piqued, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, Because everybody loves Revelation because it's so wild. And so what is the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation is that last book of the Bible, written around 90 to 99 A.D., late 90s, Uh, by the Apostle John, who was Jesus' disciple. John wrote five books. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he wrote Revelation. John wrote Revelation when he was on the island of Patmos. We talk about social social distancing today. Uh, You want to talk about ultimate social distancing. John was exiled to live in isolation by himself on the island of Patmos, not because he had COVID-19, but because he was preaching Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so he's exiled to live by himself. And while he's on the island of Patmos, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father, come to him and give him a revelation. 
a peeking behind the curtain, so to speak, on the end times. When does that occur? It occurred as soon as Jesus ascended into heaven. He could come back at any moment to end all things. And so John is taking a peek behind the curtain as to what's happening on the spiritual plane behind the physical plane. And in chapter 7, he sees the throne of God. He sees heaven. And that's where we pick up. Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. After this, I, John, looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. John gets to picture heaven, and what does he see? Before the throne of God, a great multitude that no one can count. You may be wondering, who are the elders and who are the four living creatures? That is a whole rabbit hole we don't have time to go down this morning. I mean, we can, but uh, I think a 30-minute sermon, you're already getting a little antsy, so if we make it an hour, you're not going to like it. (laughs) So we'll dive into that topic another day. But John sees the throne. He sees a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, peoples, tribes, and language. He sees a great multitude. Who does he see? The holy Christian church. Do you know how many nations there are in the world right now? How many countries? Roughly 195, give or take one or two. 195 countries. Do you know how many nations, or I'm sorry, not nations, do you know how many tribes there are? Probably too many to count, but do you know how many tribes that have not been contacted yet that we know of? Right around 100. 100 tribes across the world that haven't had contact. We see them on drones. Most of them are in the Amazon jungle. And yet every nation, every tribe, before the throne of God. There's people, and there's all languages before the throne of God. Do you know how many languages the Bible's been translated into today? I think I heard someone say it. Roughly 700. 700 languages. Incredible, right? Do you know how many languages there are in the world? 7,300. Think about that. That means 6,600 languages cannot read the Bible in their native tongue. And yet, what do we hear? People from every language will be in heaven. We've got a lot of work to do before Jesus comes back, I guess. Now, just a note, that doesn't mean that those people can't read the Bible. They'd have to read it in a second language but they can't read it in their primary language. John sees this great multitude from every nation, tribe, peoples, and language. Do you know what that means? There's diversity in heaven. What separates us here on earth is celebrated before the throne. What separates us here unites us in heaven as we unite around the Savior Jesus. Jesus unites everybody. No matter your background, no matter where you're from, no matter your language, no matter your tribe, no matter your people, no matter your nation, you are united around the Savior with them. He makes us one. John sees the the holy Christian church. Notice what they're wearing. White robes. It's a symbol of holiness. It's a symbol of pure. It's a symbol of being washed. He sees these people holding palm branches, which was the ancient sign for victory. And that's what they have because of Jesus. He sees the holy Christian church. Holy because they've had their sins washed away. 
Christian because they've built their life on Jesus as their Savior. Church, because they've been called out to live for Jesus. And in the Holy Christian Church, there are two aspects. The first one, which John has seen, is the Holy Christian Church contains the church triumphant. That's what this great multitude is. They have triumphed. They have won the race. They are victorious. They ran this race on this planet, in this world, and they held on to the faith that Jesus is their Savior, and now they've been brought into heaven. They are victorious over sin, death, and the devil because Jesus was, and so they are too. Before the throne, John sees probably Adam and Eve, Moses, Elijah. He probably sees Isaiah. And maybe he even got to see Peter, his brother James, Paul. Because by this time, all the apostles except John had been put to death for preaching Jesus as a Savior. And they were part of that group, the triumphant group in front of the throne. The Holy Christian Church. The church triumphant. And then an elder touches John on the shoulder. Here's what he says. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here's a picture. John's looking over here. Great multitude that no one can count. And he's amazed. And all of a sudden he gets a tap on the shoulder. And the elder says, hey John, these people over here who are entering, who are they? And where do they come from? And John says, you tell me, you know. And he says, these are they who have just come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You see, what John, John had the opportunity to see something that we don't. We see the other end of that. Those people who were just entering had loved ones left behind who are sad right now. But John got to see the very moment that they died and entered the church triumphant to stand in the great multitude that no one can count. He sees as they enter heaven. And notice what the elder says. These are they who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. The church triumphant, forgiven, holy because of Jesus. And now they've been called out of the earth to enter heaven as they died, to live before the throne forever, to join the holy Christian church forever in heaven. But did you notice where, John, where uh, the elder says they came from? The great Tribulation. The great tribulation. Isn't that interesting? What's he talking about? Life here on earth. The great tribulation. That's what the angels refer to living on earth as the great tribulation. And so the Holy Christian Church contains another aspect. The church triumphant, yes, but also the Holy Christian Church contains the church militant. No. No. Not holy crusades. Not against people. The holy Christian church on earth is militant. We fight against temptation. Against sin. Against the devil. We fight to hang on to the faith. You and I are part of this aspect of the holy Christian church. The church militant. You are Christian. Because your faith is in Jesus as your Savior. You are built on Christ. And so you are a Christian. You are holy because when Jesus died for you on the cross, he washed all of your sins away. The stickiness of guilt that you have such a hard time getting away that you can't get off of yourself has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Last night, uh, we had an ice cream truck come through our neighborhood, right down our street. And we got Lily one of these... Uh, like rainbow popsicle things. And it, to be honest with you, it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to taste terrible, but it actually was really good. Um, but it melted like crazy. And so between Ann, me, and Lily, we passed it around, and by the end, we were all sticky. And if you've ever had sticky hands, 
you know that the only way to get rid of that stickiness is to wash your hands under water, right? You can't get it away by just rubbing your hands or wiping it on a towel. You have to use water. Guilt is like that, isn't it? You can try as hard as you can to get away the guilty feelings that you have, but nothing is going to wash them from your mind except for the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus. And that's what he's done for you. He shed his blood on the cross to remove the stickiness of your guilt. And because he has, and because your faith is in Jesus as your Savior, your guilt, that stickiness of guilt is removed. Because of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, You've been washed, you've been cleaned, and you are forgiven. You are holy in God's sight. So you are a Christian, you are holy, and you're part of a church that have been called out of this world to be part of the family of God and live for Him. You are connected to the church triumphant, and you are connected to every Christian here on earth. Every Christian around the world is your brother and sister in Christ. They too have been washed. They too have been forgiven. And we are connected through Jesus. And all of us are running to the church triumphant when we get to join that great multitude. And so let me ask you, what's your goal in life? What's your goal right now? Is your goal to get through fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, is your goal to just get through the school year? If so, your goal is too short term. Is your goal to finish college and get a career? If so, your goal is too short term. Is your goal to get married and have a family? If so, your goal is too short term. Is your goal to raise your kids, get them through college, and, and see them off and see that they are they are a, a successful adult, if so, your goal is too short term. Is your goal to work really hard, save up a bunch of money, and to retire early? If so, your goal is too short term. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, okay, fine, my goal is to live to be 95 years old, stay married to my spouse, and be married for 40, 50, 60, 70 years. If so, your goal is too short term. The goal for every one of us, being part of the Holy Christian Church, is to get to the church triumphant, is to run the race, and to be one of those people that John saw popping into heaven for eternity, who's washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and now we get to stand before the throne of God forever. That is every single one of our goals as the Holy Christian Church. It's the goal of your spouse. It's the goal of your kids. It's your goal. It's my goal to get to that church triumphant. Unfortunately, we aren't there yet, are we? Instead, we're living in the great tribulation. And as you hear that, you may think, come on, Stephen, that's a little dramatic. <laughs> the great tribulation? It's true, while, while living here in America, we, we've had prosperity for so long that it's hard to remember that we are in the Great Tribulation. We've kind of been lulled to sleep, that it's not that bad. And yet, if you look around the world, Christians are being put to death at, at a, a rate that is perhaps the most in history. I don't know if you've been following along with what's happening in Afghanistan right now, but I just read uh, last night that the Taliban reached out to the Christian churches there and said, we know who you are and what you're doing. And the Christian churches said, we're not leaving. So in the next couple of weeks, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan will be those that are popping into the church triumphant. We pray for them, that they hold on to the faith, that they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, that we may see them one day as we gather before the throne of God, holding palm branches because we've been victorious over sin, death, and the devil. Here in America, we don't get threatened with death. Instead, Satan chooses a different tactic. His tactic for you and me, for the great tribulation, 
is the hardships of this world, the fears, the worries, the anxieties, and of course, apathy. Being apathetic to two things. Apathetic towards sin, first and foremost. The devil wants us to think that it's no big deal to sin. The devil wants to think that the Christian life isn't a life of of fighting, it's a life of prosperous. That once you know that Jesus is your Savior, you can live however you want. You can do what you want, you can think what you want, you can act however you want, because it's no big deal. Jesus forgives you. Apathy towards sin. And he lulls us to sleep, and he says you can wake up and not be on your guard, not fight the sinful temptations that we face every single day. And yet that apathy sets in and it drags us away from the Holy Christian Church. He also uses apathy toward our relationship with Jesus. We know that. We know what the Bible says. We know the stories. It's not so much a relationship, it's a fact-based thing. I know Jesus. I know what he did for me. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to Bible study. I don't have to join with other Christians because I know all that. And that apathy separates us from the communion of saints, the joining together of holy ones, and the devil picks us off. Like a a roaring lion, he's looking for someone to devour. And who's the easiest to devour? The one that's not in the group. And how do we get there? Apathy toward our relationship with Jesus. Apathy towards sin. Don't be fooled. We are in the church militant right now. We are fighting the fight of faith. We are fighting sin. We are fighting temptation. We are fighting the devil. And we are fighting as we run our race to the church militant, or church triumphant. And so what does this mean for you and me? We are part of the Holy Christian Church. We are connected to those in heaven. We're connected to Christians across the world today. What do we want to take away? What do we want to do? I hope you see this. We need the communion of saints. We need the joining together of holy ones, which is what we are. Holy because only because we've had our sins washed away through Jesus as our Savior. And we need to join together as a communion of saints to encourage one another and to be encouraged. I learned that lesson, the, the, the importance of being encouraged probably the, the best when I ran two Spartan races. Uh, the first one I ran, I ran with Anne and a group that we worked out with. And a Spartan race, the 8 to 10 miles, 30 obstacles. Uh, and the first time I ran it, it wasn't so bad because I had a group that encouraged me. When, when I was feeling like I wanted to quit, they picked me up. And we ran it in really good time, and then we all celebrated at the end together. The second time Anne and I were going to run it, we were going to run it just the two of us. And we bought tickets, and then Ann found out she was pregnant with Lily, and she said, I'm not going to run it. Well, because I paid for it, I was going to run it. <laughs> uh, and so I went and ran it by myself, and it was not good. Uh, I finished, but I walked plenty of times, and I thought about giving up numerous times. And the same is true for our walk and our race in the Christian life. When we run by ourselves, is it possible to finish the race? Absolutely, but it's a lot harder. The devil's going to work on you and work on you to get you to give up because we're in the militant, we're in the great tribulation right now. And so we need the communion, the joining together of saints. We need to encourage and be encouraged. But why don't we? What stops us? Two reasons. Pride, and if we're honest, our selfishness. Pride, because if I'm going to let myself be encouraged by others, I'm going to have to be honest and open about what I'm struggling with. I have to be honest that I don't have it all together. And you know what? It's okay. Because neither do you, (laughs) because we're all sinful. And we're living in this great tribulation. On the flip side, I have to not be selfish and only worry about myself. 
if we're going to encourage and be encouraged, we have to invest in other people. And what does that mean? That I have to take the time to invest in you. I have to take the time to get in your mess at times. I have to take the time to not only be concerned about where I'm going, what I'm doing, but to be concerned about what is going on in your life. And yet, friends, as holy ones, through the blood of Jesus, as saints, with all the same goal of reaching the church uh, triumphant, let's encourage one another. Let's build each other up in Jesus. Let's get into the mess. And how do we do it? With a clear heart? View each other as saints. As holy ones. View each other as people for whom Jesus died. And then we want to encourage each other because you have the same goal and I have the same goal and it's to reach the throne of God where we worship Jesus every day. And there we will experience this. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, because the communion of saints is what motivates us, encourages us to reach the church triumphant. And so do just that. Next week, you're going to hear of six different opportunities to do it. Four connect groups, small group Bible studies, one Bible study on Sunday morning, and one starting point class with me as we look at who God is and what God has done. Join together with the communion of saints. Be encouraged as we live in the great tribulation. Point your eyes to Jesus, the chief cornerstone that we've built our life on. Know that your sins are forgiven. Death has been conquered, and we are going to reach that church triumphant where we worship him forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for the communion of saints. We thank you that you have forgiven us all of our sins through Jesus. You've washed us clean. We are holy in your sight. And now we get to stand before your throne uh, now, but also forever as we enter the church triumphant one day. As we run this race, let us encourage one another. Let us be encouraged. We ask that uh, you continue to hold on to us as we run. Uh, Satan is trying so hard to, to get us to fall away, and yet, Lord, we want to be with you and we can't wait for that day till we reach our goal. And that is with you before the throne of God with the great multitude that no one can count. Be with us. Continue to let us grow closer to our Savior Jesus uh, that we may grow in the forgiveness of sins that he's won for us, the resurrection, and the life everlasting. In your name we pray. Amen.